All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So today I'm going to be talking to you about planning for placement, uh, when to consider types of care. Um, I'm going to go over basically some long term care options um, and then also get into talking about considering your costs and your budget. Uh, and I'll touch briefly also on legal considerations. Um, I, I'm mainly going to focus on, you know, the different care options and planning for budgeting for those. Um, also, to get started, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about me. Um, so my name is Kelly McCormick, and I am by day, I'm a professor at University of Houston. I teach entrepreneurship. Um, but I also am, uh, my mother, Diane, was diagnosed with dementia in January of 2012. Um, and about five years later, she required full-time care. And so she moved her down to a care facility um, in Houston where I live. Um, and I was 29 when we started looking for care and I had no idea what I was doing. I'd never, I had no idea the difference between independent living or assisted living or memory care, which I'm gonna talk about today. Uh, I was completely confused, totally lost, no idea how to pay for these things. Um, and so I started kind of working on different ways to help out people that were in the same position that had no idea where to start, didn't understand the process, didn't understand some of the resources that were available to them, um, just so that I could, you know, try to make something good out of this whole ordeal, which, um, as you probably know, is difficult, but uh, I'm hopefully can can be helpful to some people. So. Um, First, I'm going to be talking about just like the different types of care that are available. And for each of these ones, I'm going to go through kind of when to consider care, uh, what this care option is, and kind of how much it costs as well. I'm going to give some basic info on the costs, um, and hopefully you'll be able, well, the thing is, I'll give you some details as well, but costs are kind of dependent on state and a lot of different factors. So I will be going over kind of how to budget and go over that information based on your state and based on what you're looking for. Um, okay, but first type of care is uh, adult daycare. So this is kind of like a regular daycare. Um, adult daycare provides supervised care and actually the community and interaction for older adults. Um, and there are some adult daycares that specifically focus on dementia and people with uh, memory care issues. Uh, they typically provide activities, and again, the ones that provide and focus on um, dementia have dementia-focused activities or memory-focused activities, um, and they also typically provide meals uh, for individuals that participate in their program. Um, it usually is a best fit for people with mild to moderate dementia. I would say that if you're a little bit more severe, sometimes they have trouble with that and handling that with the whole community. However, each place is different. Um, there's a very well-known one in Houston, and I know that they do have trouble sometimes and they, they specifically look for mild to moderate dementia, but depending on where you are, they might might be more accessible. But this is, is a really good option, especially if you have someone at home with you to just give you kind of a break during the day or somewhere to go during work. Uh, it's, a, it's a good fit for that. Um, the average cost, is usually between 80 and $100 per day. Um, and typically you sign up your loved one for a number of days per week. However, again, that's highly dependent on the facility and how they handle it. Um, it's just kind of up to you. So this is a an option for care, for help and support, um, but not necessarily for long-term care. So similarly, independent living, this is kind of an interesting one because a lot of people start an independent living and then have to move on to assisted living or they need health care that's in the um, independent living. Basically, independent living, though, will not provide any kind of medical care or health care beyond just like having really a um, kind of one of those medical alert lights that's in an independent living facility. So um, it's not it's if you need medical care, if you need nursing care or your loved one does, this is Really not the best option, but again, this is kind of an interesting because there has been difficulty finding sometimes long-term care facilities. So these independent living facilities have actually become an option, but with home health aides being there as well. And that 
can get a little pricey though. So that's the problem is that you're basically combining the cost of independent living with the home health care aid, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but if you're if your loved one is very early stage, this might be an option, um, but potentially only if there isn't like a continuum of care that's available at the facility. And a continuum of care essentially just means we have independent living, but we also have assisted living. There's also memory care. And oftentimes that resides in one facility um, that they can just kind of graduate as care is needed um, into the different area of the facility. So if that's something you could do for a while to avoid um, the higher costs of long-term care placements like assisted living or like um, nursing homes, that's that's certainly an option, but um, not going to be really viable for very long, especially if someone's dealing with dementia. After a while, it just becomes to the point where they need more care. Um, because the co because the actual interaction with the staff is much lower, that's usually a much lower cost. The national average is about twenty five hundred dollars per month, which is is just much cheaper than some of the healthcare options. So that said, there's also in home care that's an option, um, and this is not necessarily placement, but again could be combined with independent living. Sometimes this is seen as done. Um, but in-home care, there's two types. One is just basic needs. The other is for in-home health care, which is what I'll kind of focus on. Um, the in-home health care is for people that actually need, you know, nursing care during or while they're, um, well, they're being tended to. Uh, and home care is just kind of like basic needs and companionship. Um, the average monthly cost, actually for both, it's surprising that there's not too much of a difference between the two, between the nursing care and just the companionship care. The average monthly cost is about $5,000 per month, and this is based on 40 hours per week. So if you're getting up to having them like 24-7, that's, that's obviously a lot more, um, and it just depends on your need and how often you need people there, and that's, that's something to consider. Um, Okay, now we're going to get into more of like the placement, uh, being placed in a facility options, which is usually what most of us are looking for when we're in, um, we're dealing with a family member that has moderate to severe um, dementia symptoms. Um, so assisted living, unlike independent living, they basically provide medical care and support. Um, the level of care can vary, but it's typically, when you look up assisted living, they usually say that it's not constant care. It's not 24 seven, but just needs help with daily activities like eating, medication, showering, that kind of stuff. Um, but this is where I think assisted living is where a lot of like moderate um, uh, dementia, uh, people with moderate dementia go. Um, and honestly, another thing about this that I just wanna be upfront about is sometimes people even in the care industry kind of um, interchange these things, you know, they'll say assisted living and they'll also kind of put roll into that memory care or skilled nursing or something like that. So I think it's really important in all of these situations just to talk to the facilities you're interested in and see what kind of the care expectations are for them. Because some people I've seen call themselves assisted living, but they do 24 seven nursing care. Um, whereas that's technically the definition for that is more of a nursing home, but I've seen them do it in college. So it's just important to kind of visit and get that information from the facility. Uh, so best fit for this is someone that, you know, again, moderate um, dementia symptoms, but not necessarily needing constant care. This is a little bit more pricey. The average national cost is approximately $4,500, um, but it's highly dependent on your state and your area. So I say state, and I kind of have a resource for looking into the state costs for all of these facility types. However, like I live in Houston, the cost to me in Houston would probably be very different from someone in El Paso or a very small town in Texas. Like it does vary greatly across states and across areas, but it's nice to have kind of a range for it so that you can budget for it. And I'll talk about how do you do that? How do you do that budgeting? But also I'll talk about what to think about if you haven't budgeted um, or if not haven't budgeted, but if you don't have the money that you need for the care that you require, or your loved one requires. Okay, so skilled nursing or nursing home. Again, sometimes people use this interchangeably, but when someone says skilled nursing, they're typically talking about um, a nursing facility that's like for temporary stays that's usually 
after an accident or a fall or um, some sort of surgery that requires re rehabilitation and medical care. Uh, they usually have specialized nurses and with specialized skills in that area. Um, nursing homes are for long-term chronic conditions that require full-time care. So something like, you know, uh, late stage Alzheimer's or more severe dementia. Um, so that they're both the, the, the commonality between the two being though that they're 24 seven care. Both of these are considered full-time care. And the average cost um, for skilled nursing or a nursing home is about $8,000 for a semi-private room and $8,100 or $9,100 for a private room. So two very different numbers, but I, I mean, it depends on, so in semi-private just means someone else is in the room with them. Private room is all to yourself. Um, so again, highly dependent on state. Okay, and last, memory care. Um, well, second to last, actually. Memory care is basically like assisted living where they give you, you know, uh, basic uh, full-time care uh, or pretty close to full-time care. And they also have the actual space locked. That's really the biggest difference, honestly, between assisted living and memory care or memory care and skilled nursing is that when people say memory care facilities, I mean, sometimes they also have you know, memory activities and they have stuff that's intended to be helpful for people experiencing memory loss. But the biggest thing is that they lock the door and they don't let people out of the facility. Um, and usually with assisted living, they have the opportunity to come and go and there's just a little bit more freedom there. But obviously with dementia, the risk for wandering is too much. And they can't let people do that. So average national cost is a little bit higher. Um, it's about 6,935 per month for average national, co national cost. Okay, and so an option I do wanna bring up that is kind of falls within a number of these, it could be considered skilled nursing, could be considered assisted living, could be considered uh, memory care depending on the facility as a personal care home. These are basically smaller homes that are run like care facilities, but they're not those like big care facilities you see that look more like apartment complexes. These actually look like homes. Um, they're usually smaller. Typically, I will say they have less, less activities. There's less interaction. So it depends on where your loved one is at in their, um, their, in their disease. But it's like, I, my mom is actually in a personal care home and I love it. Um, my mom's personal care home is actually run by a small family and like the mom is the head nurse and the, her two sons are the manager and the cook. And they just, they have less staff, but the staff to individual or resident ratio is usually a lot better because there's not as many residents and it's just more like a home feel. But if your loved one's still kind of active, it might not be the best op option just because there's it's smaller and it's just more low key. But they do typically cost less, um, anywhere from 20 to 30% less than assisted living or memory care. Um, this, they can be a really good option if it's something, if you're struggling to actually pay for care. Also, I do want to say, if you have a question, like, feel free to raise your hand. I'm happy to take questions as well or help in any way that I can. Um, I'll give time for that at the end as well, too. Though. Okay, so those are the options. Those are mainly the options. I'm sure there's, might be, I, th I think I've covered all of it, but there might be some random options in there. Uh, but for the most part, these are your options when it comes to planning for care. Um, and I think it's just important to know, again, when I started, I had no idea. <laughs> I was looking at independent living facilities and people were like, you absolutely cannot do this. So I hope this is a good overview of what to be looking for and like maybe when you should be looking for your loved one, what your options are. Okay, so how to plan for care. So this was something that was wildly unfamiliar to me and something I had no idea how to do and was totally nervous about. And it can be very nerve wracking. So I just kind of, I created this little um, kind of calculation or budgeting tool to be able to help with that. So basically there are two things you really need to know, how much you have and how much you need. So how much you have are your assets. How much do you actually, are you able to spend on your loved one's care? And there are two types of assets that you should be looking into. So one is like your general lump sum assets. So something like the physical assets, like a home, a car, anything that has value that you could potentially sell for the care of your loved one. Um, 
And then also when you're looking at Medicaid, if that's something you're going to apply for, which I'll talk about in a minute, those kind of assets, you do they, they will count as your assets towards your Medicaid and potentially not allow you to get Medicaid um, if you have those assets and don't actually uh, liquidate them for the care. Also, stocks, bonds, retirement funds, all that stuff. Um, and then a really little neat little tip down here is to look for any unclaimed funds that you might have. Uh, the USA.gov uh, has a USA.gov is part of their website is to look for unclaimed money, which is kind of cool, especially if you're searching for money to actually pay for your loved one's care. And then there's another website I haven't used, but I've heard good things about it. It's been verified.com. And again, it's helpful to find money that is yours, but is you haven't actually claimed or for your loved one. Uh, cash and savings, probably pretty obvious, but of course it's something you need to put into that. And then also if you have any life insurance plans that could be paid out potentially early, that's another thing to consider. So these are like your general assets. And I'm going to be honest, like we did not have any going into this. So um, I was like, I don't know what we're going to do. This is going to be a nightmare. But if you have more, the more you have of this, the, the less you'll chip away each month. Um, or, you know, you have a big old pot, bigger pot to chip away from each month. Uh, but you also need to know your monthly assets or your loved one's monthly assets. So number one, social security. Um, if your loved one is taking social security or if they're eligible for social security, their monthly income from that is something that you can take into account in order to be used for their care. Um, if you don't know how much they're going to get, there's a little cool planning guide that you can use that I've linked here. Um, it's ssa.gov backslash benefits, backslash calculators, or if you just Google, you know, benefit calculator, social security, it should pop up as the first option. And basically you should be able to get a quick estimate on how much your loved one will get in social security if they aren't already taking social security. But if they are, then of course, that's something to add in to your monthly assets um, that can be drawn on each month for their care. Another one is private pensions. Um, this is mainly private pensions because public pensions kind of sometimes decrease the amount of Social Security. But if you have a private pension, um, that would be good to look into. Uh, fun story. I actually had my mom had a pension that I did not know about. And she let all this mail pile up because that's what happens sometimes. And I I almost threw out all this mail. I just was like, I don't need all this mail. It's garbage. Like, I'm just I don't need any of it. I know what our situation is. And. I decided last minute, I was like, I'm going to go through it actually. So I went through it and found out she'd had a pension for a long time that she hadn't been taking. And then also that we could use every month. So highly recommend reading mail as well. Um, VA bene benefits are for veterans. Um, there are some really interesting care benefits for veterans and their spouses. And the way that they give benefits for aid and assistance is actually different from how they give like veterans pensions, I think you only had to serve for 90 days and one of those days being wartime or being considered wartime by the um, by the government. So sometimes people don't even realize they qualify for this. In fact, I read a statistic recently that said less than 5% of veterans use this benefit and it is a benefit that's awarded to them or that's, that's given to most veterans and their spouses. So I, I think it's dependent on your need and dependent on a number of different things. Um, and you do have to qualify based on income, but I think the last time I looked, the income was about $150,000. So if your income is below that, um, and that can also take into account like care costs, uh, then you would qualify for it. I'm not super familiar with this whole program. I will be honest about that, but I do think um, you should definitely look into it if you or your spouse is a veteran. And even if you're loved one has, is divorced from a veteran, that might even still be um, available to them as a benefit. So highly recommend looking into it. I think it's up to $1,800 that they can take as a benefit. And so that's super, super helpful for any of these options to have that money if you need it. Um, another option is long-term care insurance. This would really have to be something your loved one took out a while ago, but potentially they, they do have that. Long-term care insurance provides some money every month for long-term care for assisted living or for a nursing home or whatever it is. Um, the problem is you can't usually get this insurance later on, especially once you've started showing symptoms of the disease, like it's, or probably just too wildly expensive. Um, but 
I, if potentially your loved one took it out a while ago, that would be great to get some financial money from that monthly as well. Um, I also recommend looking into this for everyone. I'm like, this is necessary for everyone my age. I tell everyone my age, we should all get long-term care insurance um, just so that you don't have to worry about it when you do get older and it's much cheaper the younger you are. So I do recommend getting that, but it is part of your, your monthly assets to be considered. Okay. So then the next thing, once you have those assets is of course the costs. Um, so basically what you got to do there is, you know, figure out what type of care you need, thinking about what type of care you need, and then see the cost for each facility. At this point, I really recommend, I have a little tool here that can help you calculate costs just for general costs in your state. Um, however, I really do recommend just checking out different facilities, seeing their cost or the price points, factoring in additional care costs, which is key as well, because a lot of facilities do kind of, I don't want to use the term nickel and dime, that's the wrong word for it, but they actually, they charge more than they say, you know, they, they charge extra for laundry or for medication management or for meals, all this stuff that you wouldn't necessarily expect to have to pay for. They do charge up charges for that. So that's something to look out for. So keeping that in mind for your cost budget. Um, and then also you have to know how long you need care, which is of course something we can never know. We don't really know. Um, but you, you could talk with your loved one's doctor about how long, they would estimate um, you would need care and the kind of care they would need for how long um, because that's that's important um, and then also another thing to factor in and this is another thing to talk about with the care facility is the potential increase in care costs like are they going to raise the rate for you so those are things to to be considering to be thinking about so here's this little tool that i i created oh um let me see if i can make this click here Okay, hold on. I might need to stop sharing this screen to share a new screen. That's okay. Okay, so I'm not sure how well you can see this, but um, if you can, basically, this little spreadsheet that I made allows you to pick the state you're in and then gives you the cost calculation for all of these different options. So for memory care, assisted living, in-home care, put in your hours as well. Um, nursing care and uh, semi-private and private. I didn't add in um, in independent living just because I think a lot, most people that are dealing with dementia would have to pair that with in-home care. So I just, I kind of added just that. Um, but this will allow you to get a rough idea of how much it costs in each um, each state. And if you're interested, there's like a data sheet on this third tab also to be able to see where I got the data from. Um, but then beyond that, there's an asset calculation similar to what I already went over. So going over like how much your home is, how much invest, how many investments you have, your retirement accounts, your cash and other assets, as well as other in monthly income. All that stuff is in the spreadsheet. And it just basically calculates how many months of care you can expect at each kind of facility, which hopefully is just kind of helpful just to, to see how much care you'd be able to get with each facility. But then also on the second tab, I uh, included another way for you to put in your uh, different, to basically compare different facilities. So you can put in the cost per month from each facility uh, and then use this little care calculator to see how much, how many months of care you'd be able to have for that facility. And then if you don't have the cost, you don't have the assets in order to actually pay for the care that you need, I'm going to talk about next what you could consider, because that is, is probably the biggest problem facing people right now is like, how do you actually, you know, financially provide resources to your loved one that isn't, uh, that you don't have the money for. So this is a kind of a quick tool just so you can see how much how much of a runway you have for care, but if you don't have the money that you need, here, let me just real quick switch around. Oh, and also 
just to be able to, for everyone here to have access to these resources, I quickly just put up a website literally last night. I was like, I'm going to just put these resources on a website so we can reference them. And it's called yourcaricovercrew.com. And so if you go there and look under the resources tab, all of these resources, including the slides I'll put up later today, if you want to reference them, your caregiver crew, all the stuff is there. Okay. Okay, so if your assets don't match your actual need, um, a couple considerations. So number one is Medicare. Uh, people talk about this a lot. Um, Medicare, I think people often interchange the words Medicare and Medicaid, and they're pretty different. Medicare can be used if you're over 65 or if you prove you have a disability, and I believe that Alzheimer's does, I'm 99.9% .9 sure Alzheimer's does, um, actually act as one of the approved disabilities to get Medicaid before you're 65. Um, however, Medicare is typically for short-term needs. And I don't know why I said typically, it is for short-term needs. Um, it's for care in a short-term care facility. So like a skilled nursing facility. Um, if you, if, you know, for instance, if you had a fall or if you had an accident, something that skilled nursing would typically be used for, because Medicare can be used for up to a hundred days. A day 101, Medicare will not pay for it anymore. So it's not really a good option if your loved one needs care for more than a few months. Um, what, and it also does, I wanna to mention too, it does pay for at-home care. Again, brief amounts of at-home care, I think that's actually 60 days instead of 100 days, but it will help with that cost if you need that. Okay, Medicaid, this is for low income. This is actually what will pay for um, your long-term care costs should you need that. Now, Medicaid, is kind of complicated, I will not lie. And Medicaid is different for every single state. How you apply, how you go through the Medicaid process, you should be looking at your Medicare and Medicaid state websites because it's a pretty different process. I just was talking to a friend last night in Atlanta and her process of going through this for Georgia was just super different. Um, and so I was, you know, I wasn't even entirely sure what her process was or anything like that. But Medicaid, you typically apply each state has different limits for what is um, considered a need-based limit. So for instance, they'll look at how much you take in an income, how much you take in per month, um, and they'll say whether or not you qualify for this long-term care Medicaid benefit. Um, and if you do, then basically the entire benefit, the social security goes to the facility and they just make up the rest of the cost. Um, it's pretty low, I will say that. Um, we didn't qualify by like $13, which was extremely, um, and gave me a lot of anxiety. Uh, but it's, it's a very low limit that they actually place on this, on Medicaid in order to get Medicaid. Um, and so you might be in that position where you don't actually qualify for Medicaid and you don't get that long-term care cost that you need. If that's the case, there are still some options. I don't want anyone to like freak out. There are a lot of options still. Um, two things that you can do. One is a spend down trust. Um, so spend down trust typically is like when some money goes into a trust and is not counted for the Medicaid portion of the um, of this calculation. They don't calculate what's in the spend down trust for the income calculation. So I'd highly recommend consulting an attorney on that. I'm not an expert on spend down trusts. So, but it is something that does exist and you certainly can utilize as an option. Another thing you can do, and this is only in certain states, it's only about five states, I know Texas is one of them, but um, is a ladybird deed. And basically what that does is keeps your house out of this income calculation. So if you have a ladybird deed, it gives money to, or gives the house to a loved one, um, and then it doesn't count toward this income calculation. I do wanna mention really quickly too, um, for the Medicaid calculation, and this is for every single state, they're going to do a look back period. It's between three to five years. But what they'll look at is basically, did you give away a significant amount of your money in order to qualify for this Medicaid credit? So like if you have $250,000 in the bank, but you want people, you want to um, utilize this Medicare, Medicaid credit so that you don't have to, you know, use that whole $250,000. So you gave it away to your daughter or something a year ago, they're going to look back at that and see that that happened and be and basically count that toward your income still. So be really careful about giving away assets in order to 
qualify for this program, that is something that they definitely look into and they that will disqualify you from the Medicaid benefits. Another quick thing I want to mention about Medicaid, um, a lot of people, and I've heard people in like the care space talk about this as if, you know, it's something you, they want to do or you would want to do. And I'm not saying like that you, maybe you do need to do this and that's, you know, that's okay. And like, there's, this is an option. It's definitely a good option, but there are less Medicaid facilities than there is a need. And it's becoming a little difficult to get care in a Medicaid facility. And I'll also say oftentimes people don't want to be in Medicaid facilities because they're larger and they don't have as much like one-on-one -on -one interaction. So there's some things to consider and I would highly recommend, you know, checking them out. And I, I, I've seen good and bad for these Medicaid facilities, but um, just checking out your options, making sure that this is something that works for you and your family uh, would be a good idea. So those are your op some of your considerations. If you do not feel like you have the money though for, for care, there's still options, don't worry. Okay, so once you feel like you have an idea of your budget, I also just wanted to go over some extra considerations when you're considering care facilities. Again, this is kind of, this is one of the resources I have linked on this quick website I threw up, um, but I put basically a list of different um, questions to ask care facilities, because I think that can be really overwhelming too. Like, what am I supposed to know from this care facility? What are they supposed to tell me about this? Uh, so I would say, you know, have questions about financials, the cost of the room, if they have those added costs that I mentioned before, um, how late payments are handled, are they going to really ding you? Are they going to be okay with it? Do they raise the rate often? Is that something that they typically do? Um, is that expected yearly rate? Also, if it's if this is a facility that you want your loved, if you think you're going to run out of money, there are some facilities that have Medicaid beds on top of just like regular care. So it could be a thing to actually, um, or it could be you also ask about if they have Medicaid beds, how do you switch into Medicaid beds and how do you handle that process? Do you already have to be on Medicaid before you start? All this stuff you could ask, those kind of questions that are that are helpful in the planning process. Also, just the facility questions like laundry, meals, showers, activities. Um, how do they get medical care? Like how do they have doctor's visits, dentist visits, any visits they need? How do they handle that? Um, you know, how can how much clothing can they bring? What kind of clothing should they bring? Furniture, other items that they have, can they bring those into the space? Um, how they can connect with you is a really big one. This became really big for me during the pandemic. Like, will they set up Skype? Will they, uh, well, now we have Zoom, but uh, will they set up a way for me to like talk to my mom when I can't be there? Um, some facilities require you to call before you come. Like, what is this process for actually seeing and connecting with your loved one? Uh, do they have emergency plan in place? Again, really beneficial for me to know about. We've had uh, Hurricane Harvey and the uh, huge freeze since I've been down here that both took out electricity for like the whole town. So um, it's really helpful to know they have an emergency plan in place for your loved one. Um, do they do any memory care activities or take any memory care precautions? And then nursing care, also really important to ask about the availability of nurses, how many nurses per resident, requirements for being a nurse in the facility, because sometimes the way they qualify nurses is different for every facility, protocol for health emergency, and a medical medical equipment on site. And again, all this stuff is kind of is listed on that site if you want this reference, but you can also ask for references. They should have references and should feel like pretty happy to give them to you. Um, okay, other considerations, just thinking about what your loved one wants out of this experience, like are they pretty far along? Do they need activity and engagement? Or is that something that's not as important? Um, my, for my mom, like she really loves animals. And so the facility we were at, they were allowed animals. And that was just like a huge thing. A lot of facilities do not allow that. So just like, what is important to your loved one? What do they care about? What kind of environment do they like to be in? Do they want to be around people a lot? Or would they rather have like a small group? Do they want to be outside a lot? Would they rather not? Um, just the, those thinking about those things is, is important. And I do want to quickly mention before we move on to other things that um, I say this a lot when I talk to people about their care needs, no matter what, it's going to feel like it's too early and it's also going to feel like it's too late to put your loved one into care. It's just going to be a very, very difficult decision. So it, it's always going to feel like, oh, I should have kept them home or, oh, this isn't not the right time, the right option. Or it's also going to feel like maybe they shouldn't 
have we shouldn't have waited this long to at least that's how it felt for me and i tell i think most people feel that way too there's always there's no perfect time to get them into care um but this is all just a gut feel thing like it really is and it's, there's no right decision it's just like does it feel right does it feel good and it's never going to feel great this is a hard thing it's very difficult but like if you find that place that you think works for your loved one you i think you'll just kind of feel it and know um other resources though that i do want to mention because i had no idea these existed but there are elder care advisors that exist to help you through the process of actually finding care for your loved one and then there's senior living advisors or specialists that will place you in care and their whole job is to find the right place for you and they don't actually typically take any fee from you they get paid by the facility which i mean some people have some issue with because then they're incentivized by certain facilities and potentially depending on the state they get paid more for certain facilities so the incentive structure for them might be a little off but there are some really good senior care specialists out there and so if you're struggling to find a place you just need some help finding the right one i highly recommend looking into that um, i know you all know probably that a place for mom and caring.com exist i know those are somewhat overwhelming to a lot of people but these are more like individual specialists to help with the process of finding care. Okay. Okay, last but not least, I'm just gonna talk quickly about some legal considerations. Um, I'm, well, I actually technically am, I've an attorney in the state of California, but I don't practice anymore. So this is not legal advice. I'm not giving you legal advice here. This is just information to consider. Um, should you be starting this process? Because you definitely don't want to be doing this too late. It's really helpful to get this one, get all this stuff in order, especially when your loved one still has the ability to contract. It's much more difficult to get documents signed or to get them notarized if like your loved one can't even contract anymore because they can't, you know, remember their name or remember you and all that kind of stuff. So I highly recommend as soon as there's a diagnosis or even before then, getting some of these um, documents in order so that you feel like you're prepared for this whole situation. Um, so number one, being an advanced directive or a living will. This is basically when someone says like what their healthcare needs, they want their healthcare, um, well, what their uh, thoughts are on their own healthcare. So like, do they want a DNR, that kind of stuff? Do they want care under certain conditions? What kind of care? All this stuff is in a, an advanced directive or a living will. However, in the umbrella of advanced directives, there's also power of attorneys. So this is a little bit different though, because for a living will, it only typically covers certain things. So you don't know what's gonna happen in certain situations. So a power of attorney is really helpful as well um, to be able to kind of have someone to speak for you that you trust to speak for you, should you not have that situation covered in your living will. So a power of attorney, you have to do two separate ones Although again, it does depend on the state, um, but typically you have to have a financial and a medical power of attorney. So medical is for medical needs, financial is for all their financial and assets and stuff like that. Also make sure they are durable because a durable power of attorney exists after um, your loved one gets sick and can no longer contract for themselves. So make sure you have those documents in order. Again, Sounds a little scary, but they're they're not that difficult. And if you need an attorney to help you with it, it, it honestly, it shouldn't be too much time from an attorney. So hopefully the cost wouldn't be too high. But there are some like really good um, online platforms to help with this um, process. And it's not it's hopefully not too overwhelming. Something I would definitely recommend getting an attorney for, though, is a will um, and your trust or any trust for a state just so that you have your assets in order or your loved one has your assets in order afterward. The last thing you want to be worrying about is if like they're giving away all these assets, um, you know, to someone that they don't even really know because they're farther along in their disease. Like you don't want to have to deal with that. So get your wills and estate or trust uh, for your estate, their estate in, in order earlier. Another thing I do want to mention is that social security representative is different from power of attorney. If you have power of attorney, a lot of times people think, oh, I can have financial control of their social security. That's not true. Um, you have to actually be elected as the social security representative, which is just a process, filling out paperwork, calling on the phone. It's, it's you know, like any government process, it's not great. But I just wanted to make everyone aware because I wasn't, and again, like something I found out later, but you you need to, to sign up to be the representative so that you're the funds can go to you and you can manage them instead of having them go to one directly. Because another thing to look out for is 
your loved one just might be giving away, not properly managing their money later on in this disease, which is unfortunate, to, but something to be aware of. Um, any questions? I think that's my last slide is the question slide. I think I'm like really close to time. They said 40 minutes and I'm like right at 41 or at 39. No questions? Well, I hope this was helpful. And again, the resources and the slides I'm, I'm putting on this website, yourcaregivercrew.com. And I'm, I think you can reach out to me through that website as well. If you ever need anything, I'm happy to chat more again. I know this process is super hard and very difficult. I hope that this information made, hopefully the process seem a little bit easier. Um, I appreciate the claps. And uh, if you, again, if you need anything, I'm happy to help and just kind of be supportive if you, if you need anything. Oh, is someone raising their hand? I think you have to hold the down the um, thing to talk. I'm so sorry. I think I, I I did that by accident. I was just trying to say thank you so much for all the information because oh. this is like a really tough thing that, you know, I'm going through and this was super helpful. Thank you. Well, I'm glad it was helpful. It is very tough and I'm so sorry to everyone go through it, but uh, it is once you, I do feel like once you get through all this stuff, it's like once your loved one is in care, it is a very, it's a relieving feeling to knowing they get the, like the right care that they need. And, um, it does work out just like one of those things. I can't even tell you. There was like several times during the process that I was like, I'm going to give up. I'm going to move to Mexico. I don't know. Cause I'm like, I can't, can't deal with this. Um, but it kept going through it and it, it just, uh, it worked I, out in the end. I get that feeling. Thank you for the encouragement. <laughs> I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, well, again, it was nice to see you all here today. Um, and let me know if you need anything. I think that we're supposed to be wrapping up now, but I'll stick around if you have any questions.